from Elizabeth Kinsey, and I'll read a little from my essay called Broken Stove House. I'm watching my husband's cat, still half my cat, a big fuzzy hairball of a Maine Coon named Randall, while my ex is on one of the first vacations in his life. He traveled to Vietnam with a friend for the food. I remember begging him about four years into our marriage, can we just have spaghetti instead of pho? <laughs> Don't get me wrong, I love the stuff, a staple noodle soup in Vietnam. I can even eat it twice a week, but he was passionate. As I push open the heavy, resistant front door, Randall recognizes me and acts like I never left five years ago. He saunters over to the orange rug and plops down, presenting an overstuffed belly to rub. I'm always shocked to enter my old house and find it exactly how I left it, except much dustier and more cluttered. If I had kept the house, I would have redecorated or sold it and moved. When I asked a friend of ours why this house looked like a best museum, he said, Mink will take any decorating scheme if it's already there, regardless of whether it's their ex-wife or Bozo the Clown. <laughs> I looked around at what used to be our dining room, devoid of my grandmother's dining set or any replacement. The wall sconces I bought at Pier 1 were still perfectly even. I used a level to hang them, although now a cobweb links them. The small love seat I recovered with sage, green damask, and matching pillows sat nakedly against the wall, unused. All my plants in every room were kept up, but their leaves had grown mangy and out of control. Not to mention the living room. Its state was in so much of a time warp that I expected some other duplicate me to turn the corner at any moment. <laughs> This house was still full of me. He just lurked there, eating, watching TV, and hanging out with that ghostly clone Beth who doesn't clean or buy anything new. <laughs> I remember reading in our bed on Saturday mornings while the birds sang in our backyard. He brought me coffee and left me to my own devices for hours. He read the newspaper and watched Saturday afternoon movies and would have done that all day if I didn't insist on driving to the mountains. His instructions are on the yellow legal pad left behind for me. It lists myriad ways to open broken doors tentatively so as not to break them completely, thus keeping them somewhat operational. That is, until they fall off their hinges. When they do, he'll be pushed into that extraterrestrial world of action. Perhaps he'll have some old pangs of feeling. What does this remind him of? His wife, who always made him do things. <laughs> I am guilty of that. I can slip into that merry person I was in this kitchen. I can see her feverishly wiping the counter to catch every crumb. When we were first married, I walked into that house with an extreme need for order, stemming from my own cyclonic family of six kids, all trying to be heard. Please God, bring me a beautiful black horse, was my childhood prayer every night, kneeling by my bed. The horse would carry me away to a clean utopia where my stuff would never be touched and always be in the same place and condition in, condition in which I left it. That came out in therapy. <laughs> my dynamic with my ex, I'll call him Bob, followed in the footsteps of my role model. Sorry, Mom. She talked when people were talking. She also asked my father to fix household items, and when he didn't, she stormed out of the house. Then we'd experience an hour or two without parents, and my mother would slink back, do the chore herself, and that was that. When Bob cooked, he was the typical chef. At the restaurant, a chef pitches the dirty dishes into a bin that Manny washes. I became Manny. <laughs> I protested at first. There are crumbs on the counters. I'll get them later, Bob would say. His later didn't match my later within 20 minutes and I would angrily wipe up the crumbs. I didn't know these types of actions, small though they appeared, strung into a long necklace of complaints that ended up as a noose around Bob's neck. By the time the weekend came around, I'd angrily cleaned each speck in our house. My straightforward query, can we go to Estes Park, ended up being the last straw and rage was all he had left for reaction. I always wanted to leave after these fits. 
Once he held my arm so tightly that it caused a bruise in the exact shape of each fingertip. He made it up to me, though, by cooking an amazing meal, therefore vindicating himself, washing the slate clean, and starting the engine over, though he still did not clean up. I wasn't always able to look back at those times and acknowledge my part in this crazy behavior. I didn't get to this objectivity without walking through fire. Randall jumped on the kitchen counter. I never used to let him do that. I snooped around. There was a bread machine I bought, still untouched, and the Picasso print on the wall we fought over. That was an issue we brought up in couples therapy. Bob was angry I bought it. What is worth spending your money on, I asked. And the answer I always got was, I don't know. Then our therapist, George, would paraphrase for him, I think maybe Bob is feeling frustrated that you both can't come to an agreement on your finances or your budget. Right, Bob? <laughs> then Bob would nod, yes. Oh, good. You can translate his I don't know. That's great. Can we take you home with us and you can continue to translate for him while we draw up a budget? After another explosive fight where I threw a vase into the driveway and threatened to drive to the state line so I wouldn't be in the same state as him, I went to see George alone. I'd asked him, do normal people live in filth and never go out on the weekends? He asked me a hard question back, what is normal? Better yet, what would a perfect life look like? And I'll let you read the rest. <laughs>